I wouldn't want to meet that guy in the bear sweater in the back alley. He looked, uh, <laughs> he looked intimidating. He filled that thing out. Um, hey, if, uh, if, if you guys would pass the connect pads here uh, down, the, down the pews, and uh, kids are dismissed for kids' own worship. Uh, if you guys would use these doors right now, too, that's, uh, that's our, our great children's programming. Um, and I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I mentioned connect cards, didn't I? I did. Okay. And if it's your first time, I'd love for you to actually put your information in there, too, in addition to your name, just so that we can send you a thank you gift. You can have lunch on the church. Um, because we're really glad that you came and checked us out this weekend, and I know that's a really big deal. Um, so, if you, uh, if you haven't been here the last three weeks, we are at the end of a series called Bless This City. And uh, people have been asking me, Pastor, when are we going to actually talk about blessing the city? And Because uh, the first week we talked about the mindset that we need to have in order to be a blessing bringer. We talked about how to bless our circle, and we talked about how to bring blessing to our family. And finally... We're ready to talk about blessing our city. Now, here's the issue is, is as I was writing this message this week, I realized that it was probably more like a four-week message. And uh, the first three weeks of the series, I've been doing one-point messages. And uh, this week, we are actually going to do a six-point message. So, praise God, we're going to get through it. We're going to go fast. Um, and I know we can do it. But uh, I, we're going to talk about the book of Nehemiah in the Bible, Nehemiah chapter 1 through 6, which is... Put it up there, uh, page 472 in the Pew Bibles. You can follow along on your mobile device. I got no problem if you guys use your phones in church. Um, the reason why we're talking about Nehemiah is because Nehemiah is a book that is just straight up in the Bible because of leadership. Nehemiah, I think, is one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. Nehemiah, God used Nehemiah to transform a city in 52 days. 52 days, Nehemiah transforms a city. He takes a city from nothing and he leads it into something. And uh, I get excited about it. It, it. It's probably one of my favorite passages in Scripture simply because I love leadership. And uh, you might be in here today and you might think, well, I'm not, I'm not that much of a leader. But I believe that God has called us to influence people in every area of our lives. And you might not necessarily have the gift, the gift of leadership. But I believe we can all be influencers. We can all be blessing bringers. And we can all change our communities. And so... Today I want to talk about six different principles that I believe we can embrace as leaders to be blessing bringers to this city. And uh, I really believe that it's going to be, even if you don't, even if you're here today and you're like, eh, I'm not so sure about the God thing, okay? I just kind of sit in church and fall asleep in the back. And that's cool. Today you want to stay awake because I believe you could learn six things that you can use to, to change the lives of people around you and be a blessing bringer to people around you. So I want to encourage you to get involved. But the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah has essentially, we'll just pretend that Nehemiah grew up in a town like Demont, and uh, he moved away when he was 20, and I don't know what he was thinking, he was crazy. But he moved out to, let's just say Dallas, the armpit of America. And uh, he moves to Dallas, which is the worst city in the world, and uh, in the worst state in the world. And uh, so he lives there for, uh, well, it's just, look, I'm being real, I've lived there, so I can say it. But uh, so he lives there in Dallas, and, and, and he hasn't been back to DeMott for 40 years, okay? So now he's 60 years old, and he's got some friends. He, actually, his brother went back to DeMott to check it out, and uh, his brother comes back. You'd be, if, if that was you, you'd be like, oh my gosh, tell me about DeMott. Tell me about what's happened. What's going on with the city? Tell me what it looks like. You know, has it grown? Has it developed? And uh, his brother comes back, and it's like, it's not good, okay? Jerusalem, which is his real hometown, has kind of turned into Gary, okay? It ain't good. It's not good. This is, this is what happens. Okay, I asked them in verse 2, uh, I asked my brother who had returned from captivity about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. Stuff is just collapsing. The wall is in rubble, and the wall of a city was like the pride of the city. The wall was a really, really big deal. Now, you know, I drove through Gary. I saw the bank of Gary all closed down with the collapsed roof. And I just, that's what it's like. It's like, boom, it's just, it's, it's terrible. It's blight in the city. It's a really big deal. The walls have been collapsed. Things aren't good. You know, they're doing specials on the decline of Jerusalem. And the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down. And this, this is really important. Okay, this, this next phrase is really important. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days... I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. This is what I love about Nehemiah. The first 
The first example of leadership that we see right here is Nehemiah is passionate about something that ain't right. He sees something that he doesn't like and he is broken hard about it. And so what he immediately does is he asks the God of heaven to let him fix Jerusalem. I believe that God has wired us with many different passions. And, and, and what Nehemiah is stumbling across right here, it's a biblical concept called, I believe, our holy discontent. Nehemiah sees it and he's like, I'm not okay with that. You know, we've got a lady in our church. She heard that 50% of the kids in our school systems are on free or reduced lunch. She said, I am not okay with that. We're going to be a part of changing that. That was her holy discontent. She said, I'm going to start a ministry that's going to address that. Nehemiah sees this city in ruins. He is not okay with that. So he's going to address that. I've got a friend. She's, she's not okay with the sex slave trade. So her and her family sold everything, sold off their business, sold their house, and moved to Thailand to be a part of stopping human trafficking in Thailand. That was her holy discontent. Content. Nehemiah, he has stumbled across his holy discontent. He goes, I am not okay with this. And so he takes initiative to stop this problem. I think, I think the hardest part of leadership, this is the hardest part of leadership, is, is to take initiative when we see a problem. The first step of leadership that I have listed, you can put it in your notes if you're taking notes, is initiation. Okay? Nehemiah needs to get started. I think so many of us, I think some of the greatest would-be leaders in our country, could be sitting in this room right, right now, okay, could have, could have been, but maybe you just never were able to take initiative on what God is calling us to do, it's the hardest step of leadership, it's the biggest hump to get over with, Nehemiah blows it out of the water, okay, he takes initiative, and I think because initiative is such a big one, I broke it down into three simple parts, Nehemiah sees the problem, okay, he takes initiative by seeing the problem, that's the first part, so many times we just have to open up our eyes and see the problem, I think so many of us, we live in DeMont, we feel Jasper County, we're like, oh man, this place, this place is Mayberry, I mean, it's great, you know, there's never been anything that's bad happened here before in our lives, and here's the truth about this town, okay, even though we have a lot of churches, 82% of our population is not connected to a church on the average weekend, 82% not connected to a church, Okay, people tell me, ah, you know, why are you going to DeMond? I mean, are there really people? To... Yes, there are people to reach there. We've got people that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to open our eyes and see the problem. Next step, Nehemiah sees the problem, and he seizes an opportunity. It says in chapter 2, verse 2, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king, king his wine. Nehemiah has the best job in the world, okay? His job is to test all the king's best wine and then serve the king a cup of wine Three times a day. Rough job. Nehemiah, literally, he's paid to taste wine. It's a, it's a very cushy job, and it's actually one of, the, one of the most respected jobs in the kingdom because he gets to approach the king. Nobody can approach the king but Nehemiah. And uh, what you need to know before we move on here is, is that it's illegal, punishable by death, to appear anything but happy in front of the king. And it's illegal to initiate a conversation with the king of Persia at this time. Okay? Um, and so, and so this is what happens. It says, I was serving the king, uh, his wine. I had never appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Obviously, the king's like, you must be really troubled. You must be crazy to appear sad in my presence because you understand that I could kill you for that. You know, I mean, it's a big deal. And so what Nehemiah is doing, he's intentionally appearing sad in front of the king so that he can ask the king for what he's about to ask. Nehemiah creates this opportunity. And notice, notice that God never told Nehemiah to do this. I think so often we get hung up on, what is God's will for my life? God, would you just tell me what to do? Just tell me. Just speak to me. You know, God never tells Nehemiah to go talk to the king. God never tells Nehemiah to take initiative. On. Nehemiah just says, you know what? God's will is not being accomplished in Jerusalem. It is not God's will for 82% of Demot to not be going connected to Christ's body. It is not God's will for the city that God's glory rests in to be in ruins. Nehemiah sees it, he says, I'm going to fix it. I think so many times we get hung up on, what well, God, would you just tell me? I mean, I'm so much happier with my daughters when they do what I want them to do without me having to tell them, right? I like it when my daughters do something without me having to tell them, hey, Isabel, take your shoes off, right? When you get in the house, it's just easier, right? It's better when they do that. And sometimes I think my heavenly father is pleased with me when I do what he wants me to do without him having to tell me. Nehemiah's the same way. He sees a problem. 
It's not what God wants. He seizes an opportunity. King says, you must be deeply troubled. And then it says, then I was terrified. Have you ever taken like the first step of initiative towards doing something great with your life? And it's like, <laughs> he's terrified, right? But he's like, no turning back because he's already, he could have, he could have right there. And I think sometimes we do this. He could have been like, oh, no, I'm not sad. <laughs> um, have you ever met people who laugh, cry? That's crazy. Okay. Um, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad for the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Okay, so he lays out the problem to the king and the king asks him, how can I help you? And with a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah and rebuild and let me rebuild the city that my ancestors are buried in. He sees the opportunity. He seizes the opportunity. And he steps out in faith. Nehemiah is leaving a great job. Okay? Nehemiah has the highest paid number two job in the city next to being king itself. Nehemiah is the envy of everybody's green with envy. Nehemiah steps out in faith away from a great job. Away from all this stuff because he believes that God has called him to a new season of harvest. I love it because Nehemiah is a pioneer. Leaders are pioneers. We pioneer over and over and over again in our lives. God's called us to a new season of harvest. That thing was going great. It was awesome. But I believe real leaders recognize when it's time to move into a new field of harvest. Nehemiah steps into a new field of harvest. He steps out in faith. And this is the coolest part. Is, is the king... Um, he asks the king to send him, but the word and what we learn later from the context of the passage, the word that's being used there is he's asking the king not only to send him, but to support him. So he asks the king to do this, and the king's like, yeah, sure. Not only does the king send Nehemiah, but he sends him armed guards. He sends him all the gold that he'll need to build the walls, and he sends him construction materials to build the walls with. The king's timber is included in this whole deal. All because Nehemiah had what I like to call an ask. Nehemiah wasn't afraid to ask. And I just think so many times in our lives, why are we afraid to ask God for something? Why are we afraid to ask something? Because sometimes you might find out, oh my gosh, I'd love to do that. I love it when my daughter asks me for things because I love blessing her because I love her. And in the same way, our Heavenly Father in Heaven loves us. We're not afraid to ask Him. So He seizes the opportunity, steps out in faith. The next thing He does, the next step in leadership that I want to talk about, we had initiation. The next thing that Nehemiah does, I call investigation. Okay? I think as leaders, this is so important. We take initiative on something, but then we need to investigate what we're actually going to do. And this is what it says. It says, so I arrived in Jerusalem three days later. I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told, this is crucial, anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. I think so often our tendency as leaders, if we're feeling a little insecure, is to be like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think about it? Please affirm me. Please, please, God, let him just affirm my plan. Let him just affirm me. Let him just affirm me. Just tell me, tell me that it's going to work. Tell me that it's not going to come crumbling down around me, right? Because as leaders, sometimes we're afraid that what, we, what we're starting isn't going to work out, and we look for this affirmation from all these other people. Who does Nehemiah need affirmation from? God. He's satisfied in God's plan for his life. And he roots his identity in who God says that he is. And so he's like, I don't need the affirmation. I don't need all their words going through my head trying to cloud me from what God has called me to do. I'm going to rebuild this city. And he knows, look, if I ask him about this, they're going to be like my brothers. Oh, it's terrible. There's nothing that we can do. It's shot. It'll never recover. You'll never be able to do it. You'll never be able to reach those people. You'll never be able to have that business be successful. You'll never be able to. And he doesn't need that. He doesn't need that in his life. So what does he do? He goes and he sees the problem for himself to get a good understanding of what needs to happen. He investigates. He looks at the wall. He sees the problem. And only after he investigates does he begin the next step of leadership. We've got initiation. We've got investigation. The next one is delegation. I think this is so important for leaders. We need to practice delegation in our lives. And I think we make a big mistake here because a lot of times what we do as leaders is we relegate. Not delegate. You ever had a boss who loves to relegate to you? Hey, I want you to do this. What, do, you, do you have any job description for me? No. Goals? No. What does winning look like? I don't know. Just do it. Relegating is not good. Relegating is where you just give somebody a job, you don't define the win, and most importantly, you're not inspiring people to accomplish what you believe is important. God hasn't called us as leaders to be relegators. He's called us to be delegators. This is what Nehemiah does, and this is really important. He calls all the people together, 
And he rolls out his plan. It says, but now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Okay, let's be honest, guys. We've got some difficult days ahead. But I've been to the mountaintop. And I've seen the promised land. And we as a people are going to get to the promised land. That's what he's saying to the people. He's inspiring them. He says, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how God's gracious hand had been on me and about my conversation with the king. He inspired them. He said, look, God's hand is on us. We as a people can get there. We as a city aren't done yet. We don't need to disappear quietly into the night. We can stand up to this. We can do something great with our lives. And we don't have to settle for the status quo. And the people are like, yeah, we can do this. Yes. And then... He delegates to them. And they say, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. And Nehemiah begins to delegate. And this is what I love. Nehemiah is really smart. He looks at the wall. Okay, he goes to each of them. He looks at the wall that they're rebuilding. Look, he looks at the wall that they're rebuilding. And he says, look, guys, I want you to rebuild the section that's in your own backyard. Okay? This, that's all you're responsible for. Because when the wall was the whole wall, you're looking down the whole wall, it looks terrible. But when you've just got that little section in your own backyard, that's easy. You know, I think sometimes we look at these jobs and they're way too big. Nehemiah is smart. He, when he delegates, he goes, look, here is your job responsibility from here to here. You see it every morning when you eat breakfast. Chapter 3 of the book of Nehemiah is all the areas that each person is supposed to rebuild. And if you look at a map of ancient Jerusalem, what he's doing is just saying, look, open up your door and go to work in your backyard. Your commute's 15 feet. You can handle it, okay? And, and he just says, rebuild that. Rebuild that. You know, and he gives people, I call it, he, he gets people to have skin in the game. I've seen people do this with businesses all the time. We do everything we can do to have people get skin in the game. I've got a friend of mine who goes to this church, and they were talking to me about how they sold a bunch of their business to their employees so that their employees could have skin in the game, so that their employees would be inspired, delegated to, so that they would want to be a part of what was happening at that company. Nehemiah is giving skin in the game for these people. I'm asking you to rebuild this wall that really affects you because if raiders come, you don't want them to get in to this city through your backyard. Your house would be the first one that gets pillaged, right? And so these people have skin in the game and they rebuild the wall in their own backyard. I think so many times as a church, we screw this up. We're like, well, we've got to do everything. We've got to do everything. 82% doesn't go to church and, and, and people in, in Africa are going to hell and... Oh my gosh, we got to rebuild the wall everywhere, everywhere, you know, and everybody's like just like throwing hammers everywhere and just like kind of just going this way. I'll go, well, no, I'll go over here, I'll go over here. And, I, and Nehemiah's like, look, 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 there's a lot of rubble. And I believe, look, there's a lot of rubble in Christendom. Look at North America right now. We got some work to do. Well, let's start in our own backyard, guys. Let's start in our own backyard. We can. I believe missions are great. Missions are really important. Global missions are really important. But I want to be a church that starts off with a local mission, saying we can build God's city in our own backyard. God's called us to that. What about our neighbors? What about our friends? What about our relatives? What about our coworkers? What about the people that we work? Are we sharing the gospel of Jesus with them? We can start with that small job description. Hey, let's bring heaven to earth in this area. Let's bring the message of Jesus Christ in this little area. This is your job responsibility from here to here, your own backyard. That's delegation. That's what Nehemiah does. And I love it, okay? So as a leader, Nehemiah starts with initiation, goes into investigation, goes into delegation. Things start going great. Things are going really well. The next, next leadership principle is a little bit tough, but um, there's a great movie I love, and, and, and some of you guys are going to judge me, but I don't care because um, we serve a God of grace. Uh, great movie that I love called Enemy at the Gates, okay? It's about uh, a German sniper and about a Russian sniper, okay? And they have this incredible battle. It's an incredible movie. I really enjoy it. I think it's a great uh, piece of history as we study what happened, the events at Stalingrad, and, and all the stuff that went down there. It's good to remember, um, but it's also just a great movie. And here's the deal. The Russian sniper in that movie is a farm boy who just has a natural ability to kill people. But anyway, um, he's greasing officers all the time. That's what he does. He greases all these German officers. It starts off, he greases a full bird colonel in the German army. Like, that's how it all starts, right? And it's incredible. It's awesome. He's always shooting officers. I think that as we in our life begin to become leaders in God's army, okay, officers in God's army, what inevitably really begins to happen in our lives, Satan's like, look, I want to get Satan's snipers out, and I want to take out that officer, Okay? So Nehemiah has to go through as a leader, now that he's gone through delegation stuff is happening, I think he has to go through something called, I just, I, I, look, I bent the word a little bit, and, and, and a lot of these points come from a good friend of mine um, who, who's also a pastor, but hateration, 
okay? Hateration. Nehemiah has to go through some haters in his life. Christian, bring, bring, that, bring, bring, bring that up here. Bring that up. I brought up something. You guys might know it as Gatorade, but this is actually a bottle of Haterade, okay? Haterade right here. We got a bottle of Haterade. Nehemiah has to go through some hateration at the church, okay? And, and, and there's a big difference between people who, look, they got honest questions and people who have simply decided to be negative in every area of your life. You might have some haters in your life. There's nothing that you can ever do to please a hater, okay? Big difference between somebody who's like, look, I got questions, I got concerns, versus somebody who is truly permeated completely head to foot by a negative spirit. You probably have some of these people at your work. It's like, oh my gosh, it's totally right. That person has never said a positive thing in their life. They're just, they're a hater. They're a hater. And I could do exactly what they're asking me to do. They're still going to hate me. These are Nehemiah's haters, okay? It says, but when Samballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan. Samballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, I love this. They were, they were three people that were supposed to be leaders in that area. And, 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 and for a long time, people who weren't Christians were like, Samballat, Tobiah, and Geshem are fictitious figures, and the whole story of Nehemiah isn't true. Okay? But, uh, but a few years ago, archaeologists found an ancient Egyptian manuscript that talked about Samballat and Tobiah as these figures who were actually appointed governors of Samaria, which was a kingdom just north of, of Jerusalem. Um, and, and, and so Sam Ballot obviously has some skin in the game. He's sitting there, and he's afraid that, that he, 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 no, he didn't rule Jerusalem, but by proxy he kind of did because there was a leadership vacuum there, okay? So that's who they are. And Tobiah is like Batman and Robin, except Tobiah has a total wee man complex. And then, um, okay, so Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and then Geshem ended up, we dug up a stone recently with Geshem's name. It turns out he was like a local despot military ruler in the area, which I think is really cool. I think the Bible, all the time people are like, ah, oh, the Bible isn't a true document. It's got all this stuff that's just fictitious, just a bunch of made-up names. But then we discover that these things aren't in fact made up and, you know, all these points that people had about, anyway, it's really cool. Totally off the point. Okay, Sambal, to Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab heard of our plan, and they scoff contemptuously. <laughs> Have you ever had people in your life that just scoff contemptuously? What are you doing? Rebelling against the king, they asked. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in our city, Jerusalem. I need an example hater up here, and he's actually a huge supporter of me, but he does have the best angry face of anyone I know. Rich Heemster, can you come up here real quick? <laughs> I, need you, I need you to come up. Rich Heemster, let's give it up for Rich. He's going to be a good hater. Rich, come on, come on, come on, come on. Run, move it. Hop in that step. Let's go. This is haterade, okay? Rich, don't, don't spill it, but I need you to sit on the wall right there. Sit on that wall and sip that haterade, okay? Now, here's my tendency, okay, as a guy. I got a hater behind me. He's looking at me all angry-like, and he's good. Look at, that, look at that. Lord have mercy. I'm intimidated, okay? But he's back there, and he's hating on me. My tendency as a pastor is just to start preaching to him, you know? And I'm just explaining God's goodness, and we can do this. We can take it. You know, and what happens is funny is I turn my back on all that God has called me to, to focus on this one guy, and guess what? I can't change him. The Holy Spirit can change him. God himself can change him. I can pray that that will happen. But, but what happens is I feel like we give up all the goodness that God has had for us, and we try to be God, and we try to supernaturally change Sam Ballot's heart, a hater's heart. I can't do it. God can, but I can't do it. And in our lives, I think we've got, we've got three kinds of people. We've got workers, people who are with you on your vision. They're with us for what God has called us to, Okay? Then we've got shirkers. They're trying to figure it out. They're like, eh, I might come. I love your church pastor. Love your messages. They're great. You serve anywhere? Nah. You give? Nah. But it's awesome. I totally, totally support what you're doing in no level other than my attendance and presence, which is good. There are people who are figuring out what's happening. I love that. I love that. Take your time. Shirkers, that's good. And then there are people that I call slurpers, okay? Slurping the haterade. He's drinking that hate juice. There's nothing that I can do. To please him. You will encounter these people in your life. You will. You probably have. You might have a hater in your own life. Could be your mother-in-law. Who knows? Whoever it is, just <laughs> sipping the haterate. Okay? We can't root our identity in these people. We can't please them. We love them. We trust that they're God's children. We believe that God, who is supernatural, and he must be to love people like this, is going to love them. But I'm not going to let him sidetrack me from all that God has called me to do. And this is, notice, notice how, 
Notice how Nehemiah handles this. They mock him, and then he says, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim to Jerusalem. So many times, my biggest haters are the voices inside of my own head. If you guys knew what was going on in my own head, you'd be like, I don't want him to be my pastor anymore. Okay? <laughs> uh, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. We all have that sometimes, and, and nobody likes to admit it, but sometimes we get craziest stuff in there. You know what happens when I have a hater in my life or a hater in my head? I say, guess what? In the name of Jesus, you have no share, legal right, or historic claim on my soul. Because I'm a son of the king. Right? You have no share, no legal right or historic claim on my soul because Jesus Christ has died for my sins. That's the message of scripture is I'm a son of the king. I walk with his anointing on my life. And far be it for me to let some guy like Sam, Bo Sam Byatt and Tobiah, whatever their names are, define who I am. Because God has a greater calling on my life. We've got a wall to rebuild. We've got souls to win. People are dying and going to hell. And I want to be a part of God's mission for my life. And I'm not going to let that define who I am because I'm a son of the sovereign God of the universe. Right? Amen? So we move on from that. It says, But Sambal, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I'd finished rebuilding the wall so that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Sambal and Geshem sent a message to me Asking, them, uh, to meet, asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Hey, will you meet me for coffee? I just want to talk to you about some stuff. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had that message, you know, from somebody? You know, it's like, ooh, they're going to ambush me. And they're going to murder my spirit. And they're going to speak curses over my life. Tell me what a fool I am. Tell me all this stuff, you know. And look, 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 look. You can meet somebody who is a questioner for coffee. But when you know that they're slurping the haterade, when they're slurping the haterade, they are drinking the juice, the hater juice. And you know that they're just hell-bent against you and God's plan on you. They might be somebody, they might be even somebody who's, you know, I think Christians are the best at shooting their own. We're the best at killing our own. We just, one of the, my favorite pastors in the country, changed my life, changed my wife's life too. God has really used him to do some great stuff. Just got eaten alive by other Christians. Just got really, literally, his church has been destroyed. And he ended up choosing to out of his own fruition because people were making death threats. Christians were making death threats against his family. Chose to step down, okay? And that, that, that breaks my heart. But listen, listen. The, instead of getting blasted by them, get, this is what he does. This is how you respond to haters. So I replied by sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work. I can't come. I'm sorry, I'm busy. You know, I can't stop this great work that God's called me to. I think so often that's a response. If you know that God has called you to something great, and you got people in the office telling you, you're never going to be able to do it, just stop. Why don't you come and talk with me, and let me just derail your plan. Let me just sidestep you. Take a, take a page out of Nehemiah's leadership. Say, hey, look, I'm, I'm too busy. I can't. Because he is too busy, and he can't. Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave them the same reply. The fifth time, Sam Ballot's servant came to me with an open letter. People tell me that the Bible doesn't transcend time and culture. Open letters are of the devil. I hate open letters. I think it's the most cowardly thing in the world to do. People send this open letter to start hating on other people. I just wrote this open letter to try and destroy this reputation of these people. Open letters. Anyway, so he sends an open letter, super passive aggressive. It's like a big blog. That's what I consider open letters. It's like the, big, the hater blog. And this is what he said. There's a rumor in the surrounding nations. And Geshem tells me it's true. Have you ever had somebody start a conversation, hey, look, I'm totally on your team, but, but so-and-so tells me. So-and-so tells me that this person, this is the real person, and I've kind of, no, you're not. Getchum tells me it's true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel against the king, and that's why you're building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest you come over and talk to me. You see the little threats right here? I mean, just what a weasel. What a conniving. And see that? He's not on my team. I'm terrified. You guys are scared of him too. You're like, geez, pastor, get him down. He is. Can you imagine that? I pray for his parents. I can't believe what it must have been like when they were like, Rich, you got you to gotta come back here and you're grounded. I mean, ah! I got him to crack. I knew I could. Chapter 6, verse 9, they were just trying to intimidating us, intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. And this is how we respond to haters every time, every time. I want you guys to let this go through your head. You might have somebody telling you, 
that God's hand isn't on your life. You might have somebody telling you that maybe, maybe God's promises aren't real in your life. Maybe you should back down from what you called you to. And this is how you respond. So I continued to work with even greater determination. So I continued to work with even greater determination. Guess what? You don't define me. God does. You can't define me. So get out that wall. Thank you. Hey, let's give it up for Rich, guys. He did a great job. He can take that haterade. It's all yours. Sip that up. Sip that up. We got to get through the haters. And guys, listen. After the haters come, you might be okay in your organization. But what you got to remember, that was an open letter. Okay? So now Nehemiah has an inspiration problem again. Maybe even Nehemiah has discouraged himself. And he has to step in to what I call, aside from initiation, the next hardest part about leadership. And that is determination. This is where the tough, the tough need to really get going. And the going need to get tough, right? This is where the rubber meets the road. Where you need to say, you know what? God has called me to this. I don't see how we can get through it. But I serve a sovereign God. And I believe that his promises are real. And so we're going to get there. Okay, and, and I love what Nehemiah does. And this is, as a leader, I always do this too. If I'm feeling discouraged, I'll call our consistory together. I'll call my leadership team together. I'll call the core leaders of the church. And I'll say, hey, remember the vision. God's called us to reach generation after generation and see them become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And we are gonna get there because God's hand is on this church. And God says, hey, I will build my church in the gates of Hades, the gates of hell itself will not overcome it. That's what the word of God says. And so we're moving forward, Right? Some of you guys have been there. Um, so this is what he says in Nehemiah 4.14. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. The buck stops here. As a church, we will not go silently into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. God's hand is on us, and our mission is too important, Nehemiah says. He says, let's double up. We're going to work harder. Forget what they say, because I'm worried about what God says and who's with me. He inspires his people, and they say, let's get going. And this is what I love. You know what? They, didn't, they stayed classy. They didn't bring the fight to those people. They said, look, we're going to stay above the fray in our life. But we're also going to be a good steward of all that God's given us. And so the Bible says they went to work with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other hand. They were ready for it, and they began to build that wall. Someone came, they were like, bam, I'll kill you, you know, because God called me to this work. I'm going to silence that. You know, if you bring the fight to me, if you begin to intrude on what God has set up, God's land, this is our land, our house, I will defend it. You know, now, officers, I'm not advocating for death here. I'm not, I, I promise you, that's not, that's not what I'm advocating for. I know some of you guys are like, oh, gosh, this is a problem. This is illegal. We gotta, we're going to have to talk to talk to that pastor after that. That's not, that's not what I'm advocating for. On a spiritual level, I'm saying we serve the Lord of Heaven's armies. As we talked about last week, we serve the Yahweh Spout, the Lord of hosts. And we can walk in confidence because of that. Let's not be afraid to pick up the sword of the Spirit. Let's not be afraid to bring the Word of God to this community because the Lord of Heaven's army stands behind us. A lot of steps here. Try not to break an ankle. Workman's comp. Can't preach. It happened while I was working. You all saw it. I'm sorry. That's just that inter internal monologue that just... We had a good jam going. Totally killed it. Praise God. After determination comes elevation, the sixth and final step in leadership. It says, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. We rebuilt a wall that would normally take generations to build. This part I love. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. This is why I love serving God. Because when, when God moves... When a victory happens, you know that it's not you. You know that God's hand was on you, and you know that the victory is real. It says, they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. They realized that God's hand was on them. They went to work, and God was blessing every brick that was laid. That's, that's what I want to be a part of as a church. I want to be a part of a move of God. 
I want to be a part of God moving in our community, and I want to build something. I want to build a city. I want to see a revival in Jasper County in this region that is something that the enemies of Christ would look at and say, surely God's hand is on them. Even our enemies, even our haters would look at us and say, surely God's hand was on them. I want to build a building so quickly. I want to do, I want to see a church grow so quickly. I want to see salvations happen so abundantly. I want to see God's blessing exude so exceedingly that people look at us and say, surely God's hand is on them. And I want to engage in a work that's so great that we give God all the glory. And people look at it and say, it was all him. So we've got all the steps to leadership that I just laid out. And uh, I think they're really important. I think they'll change my life. And, you know, as a preacher, most of the time, I'm just preaching to myself. I'll be honest. You know, most of these messages, when I come up here, it's like, man, the guy who's probably getting ministered the most is just, is just me. You know, and I hope you're blessed by it. But I just want you to know that God has called us to something great. And God has called us to be a blessing to the city. That is the purpose of his church, to the glory of God the Father to bless all nations through Jesus Christ. That's what the, that's what the Bible says. That was, that was where it all started, is to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And so I want to ask you guys, will you stand in the gaps of the walls here in DeMott? And Grant, can you come up and, 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 and hit the keys for me? But will you, will you stand up in the gaps of the walls of our city? Will you guys rebuild the walls in our own backyard? I believe that, that God has a unique calling on each of our lives. And God might have put a holy discontent on your heart years ago. Maybe today's the day that we pick that up. We as a church just say, it's time. This is our time. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you got stuck on determination. Maybe that was something that you couldn't get through. But what if you just redoubled your effort today and said, you know what? God's hand is on me. I'm going to walk into the victory that he's called me to. Maybe there's a sand pallet in Tobiah in your life that you need to stop letting the fighting you. You know, I want to see God bring us to a new level as a church. But I also believe that God wants us as individuals to become all that he's intended for us to be. Maybe God's just speaking to you today specifically about that. 82% of our community really matters. We're not just here for the 18%. I believe as a church, God's placed us in this time, in this community, to see people far from God filled with life in Christ for generations to come. I want to lay that foundation as a church. I want to build those walls. Will you build with us? Will you go on this with us? Will you bless this city with us? Will we build businesses? Will we build families? Will we raise our kids? Will we build marriages? Will we build circles of friends that are about bringing God's blessing to this city? We've got some ways for you to do that in the immediate term. We've got trunk or treat. If you want to volunteer for that, please email us. We're not in crisis mode anymore. We were earlier this week. Tabby called me up and said, John, the sky's falling. Um, I was like, Tabby, God's, gonna, God's got it. We're going to get through it. But if you want to volunteer, we'd love to have you be a part of that. It's going to be one of the biggest blessings to our city that we do all year. 2,000 people are coming. It's going to be great. This year, we're not defining success for Trunk or Treat by the number of people that come. If 2,000 people, 3,000 people come to Trunk or Treat, great. But giving kids candy is not what will change eternal destinies. I want to define the win of Trunk or Treat by how many people are going to come hear the gospel at local churches. We're inviting people to Jesus in 3D, and I put an invite card on each of your seats um, oh, this is so cool. We forgot to put the indicia, the postal mark on there, but the post office was like, you can send it out anyway. We're sending out 9,300 mailers to every single home in the local communities, inviting them to come hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's so cool because that's what it's about. Jesus came so that we can have eternal life. He paid the price for our sins so that if we ask him to forgive our sins and lead our life, we can spend eternity with God. That's, that's the gospel in a nutshell. We've got Super Saturday. I want to encourage you guys to be a part of that. Um, it's going to be exciting. Uh, lots of different ways you can get plugged in. But I want to close with this verse. This is a big deal. I want you to hear this. Jeremiah 29.7. It's the key of this whole passage. And I, I just, 
I want you guys to hear it one more time. And maybe even just, let's, let's close our eyes just for a moment. Because I really want you to hear these words. And I don't, I don't want us to pass on them as I read them. Jeremiah 29, 7 says, and work. And work. And work. We're going to get to work. For the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare will determine your welfare. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your calling on our life. We thank you that you erase our past and give us a future. We thank you that you're a God of hope. We thank you that your, your sovereignty transcends every area of our lives. And we thank you that you're the God of this city. I ask that you would use us as a church to bring your glory and your gospel to everyone around us. I ask that you would use this church to bless this city in new ways. I ask that, that you would do greater things here through us, Lord, that we could be a part of it. I ask that we as a church would be united together for your plan and purpose here, Lord. I ask that you would use us for the prosperity of this city. I thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, and for how your hand is surely on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.